functions help us generalize drawing pictures based on equations that we've been used to do before. For example, consider the graphs of a quadratic curve and a circle. In the former case, if you were to draw a vertical line, this vertical line would intersect the quadratic curve exactly once, while if you did the same with the circle, it sometimes intersect the circle more than once. The vertical line can be thought of as the input, and the height of the dot can be thought of as the output. In the quadratic curve case, one input gives us exactly one output, and therefore the quadratic curve is a function of x. However, in the case of a circle, one input may produce two outputs, and therefore a circle is not a function of x. Consider the functions 1 over x and the square root of x plus a quarter. If we draw a vertical line at the center, we realize it would not intersect the curve at all. However, if we just nudged it a little to the right, we will see that there will always be intersections, likewise on the left of that center line. The inputs that give us at least one output is known as the domain of the function, and we can represent it using the symbol d sub f. Likewise, with the function square root of x plus 1 quarter, we're going to obtain a domain that corresponds to the non-negative real numbers. We could also check for its output values, and in the case of the function f, its output values, known as the range, are denoted by r sub f. For the function g, its range is going to be the real numbers that are not smaller than a quarter, and it's denoted by r sub g. If we looked at these two functions, a really useful operation is to plug one function into another, but how do we know which is a legitimate operation? We can represent the function f using this arrow diagram, as well as the function g using this arrow diagram. Roughly speaking, we want to take the outputs of one function and plug them into the inputs of another function, and finally collect their outputs in this smaller set over here. The inputs and the new outputs would form the composite function g circle f, and this would only make sense precisely when the outputs of f lie inside the domain of g. From the same picture, the domain of g circle f being the inputs of the function are actually the same set as the domain of f. We can recall our previous calculations of the domains and ranges of the functions f and g and ask which of the composite functions makes sense. Let's see if the function g of f of x makes sense. Let's compare the range of f with the domain of g on this number line. As we can see, there are some negative numbers that do not lie inside the domain of g. This tells us that the range of f is not a subset of the domain of g, which tells us that the function g circle f does not exist. On the other hand, we could check for the existence of f of g of x by comparing the range of g with the domain of f on the same number line. Since the entire range of g lies inside the domain of f, we can say that the composite function f circle g must exist. Furthermore, we can calculate a formula for f of g of x. We can write f of g of x using the formula for f of x in terms of g of x. We can furthermore expand the expression for g of x. This gives us the formula for f of g of x, and we've seen just now that the domain of the composite function is equal to the domain of the inner function. And in this case, that would simply be the non-negative real numbers. To find the range of the composite function, we would take the range of the inner function, that is, the real numbers bigger than or equal to a quarter, we'll plug it into the function and collect the outputs. This gives us the range of the composite function to be the real numbers strictly bigger than zero and not more than four. On a related note, consider the function f of x equals to x squared. Can we find a function g such that when f of x is plugged into g, the f and the g can cancel each other out. This gives us x. 
Furthermore, would this g satisfy f of g of y being equal to y? If such a g exists, we call it the inverse of the function f. To visualize using an arrow diagram, the inverse function reverses the function f. And since its inputs are the outputs of f, we can say that the range of f is actually the domain of f inverse, and the domain of f being the outputs of f inverse ought to be the range of f inverse. Can we calculate a formula for f inverse? We will let x equals to f inverse of y and apply f on both sides since f and f inverse cancel each other out. But f of x is simply x squared, from which we can take square roots and remember the plus or minus. Since x is a non-negative real number, we can only take the non-negative option for x. This tells us that f inverse of y is precisely the square root of y. However, if we were to relax the input conditions for x to be any real number, not just a non-negative one, then at this step, x could legitimately be either the positive or the negative square root of y. This means that any subsequent working does not really hold water. But that tells us that x can take on two values for the input y. So is this a function? Let's visualize it by drawing the graph. In the restricted domain case when x is non-negative, the outputs of f are the inputs of f inverse represented by the horizontal line, and the outputs of f inverse are represented by the vertical line. No matter which horizontal line we draw, it will always intersect the quadratic curve exactly once. This means that every input gives off exactly one output, and f inverse is a function. However, if we were to relax the domain to all real numbers, we would need to draw the other side of the curve. Now, there are many, many horizontal lines that give off two different outputs in the x-axis. This tells us that f inverse isn't exactly a function at all. In this situation, we say that f inverse does not exist, and this is known as the horizontal line test. Inverses can help us make sense of transforming graphs. Consider this graph of y equals to f of x. If we were to replace x with the expression x minus 2, what do you think would happen to the graph? Rather surprisingly, it would do the exact opposite of the change that you made to the equation. The graph is going to translate by two units in the positive x direction, which is essentially the inverse of subtracting by 2. What happens if we replace x with x plus 2 instead? Then the graph would oppose this change and translate by two units in the negative x direction. Likewise, if we replaced y with y minus 2, we will get a translation by two units in the positive y direction, and if we replaced y with y plus 2, we will get a translation by two units in the negative y direction. If instead of adding by 2, we divided by 2, the graph is going to oppose division by 2 by scaling by a factor of 2 parallel to the x-axis. And similarly, if instead of the expression x, we have the expression 2x, the graph is going to oppose this transformation by scaling by a factor of a half parallel to the x-axis. Likewise, if we replace y with y over 2, or we replaced y with 2y, we would get corresponding scalings parallel to the y-axis. If we replaced x with negative of x, we would get an absolute reflection of the exact same graph about the y-axis, and if we replaced y with negative y, we would get a reflection about the x-axis. These are known as affine transformations, where the shapes of the graphs after the transformations more or less remain the same. However, there are some useful non-affine transformations for us. For example, the transformation y equals to modulus of f of x would require us to flip the entire graph and then keep everything that remains positive. On the other hand, if we had the transformation y equals to f of modulus of x, we would reflect about the y-axis and keep the non-negative input copy as well as the reflected copy. 
if instead we calculated the derivative of f, we would plot a function that corresponds to the gradient of the curve at the different points. And finally, if we plotted the reciprocal function, we're going to get a very strange shape, which roughly speaking converts small output values of y into large output values of y, and vice versa. These transformations help us make sense of conics such as the unit circle that we've encountered before. Can we stretch it out by a factor of 3? We will just replace x with x over 3 and apply the corresponding scaling. Can we scale parallel to the y-axis by a factor of 2? We just need to replace y with y over 2 and apply the corresponding scaling. To translate in the x direction, we place x with x minus a positive real number. And to translate in the positive y direction, we place y with y minus a positive real number. This gives us the general formula of an ellipse, where hk denotes the center and ab denotes the horizontal and vertical radii respectively. In fact, if the horizontal and the vertical radii equal to each other, we actually recover the general formula for the equation of a circle. However, if we were to replace the plus sign with the minus sign, we're going to get this weird shape with two branches. This is known as a hyperbola, and its general equation follows the same shape as that of an ellipse. It has these two special lines known as asymptotes. And if we were to plot the same expression on the left side, but minus one on the right side, we would still get the same asymptotes, but instead plot the other pair of curves that corresponds to the other hyperbola. If we were to scale a little bit and do a little bit of rotation, we actually recover the equation of a reciprocal graph. This is one of the functions that we encountered really early on. And if we were to modify the 5 into the term x plus 1 or some other term, we can get a modified hyperbola. And these are how hyperbola are both conics and functions, which helps us summarize functions in a nutshell.